Hi, everyone. Thank you for an opportunity to talk to you about some of our recent work. My name is Art Bader. I'm a physician scientist within the Enteric Neuroscience Program in the Division of Gastroenterology and Hepatology. And I'm an associate professor in the Departments of Medicine and Physiology at the Mayo Clinic in Rochester. Today, I'll talk to you about irritable bowel syndrome as a mechanopathology. So let me give you a brief outline. First, I'll introduce the common GI functional and motility disorders, and I'll specifically introduce these as mechanopathologies. I will tell you about the sensory circuits that are involved in sensing of forces in the gut, and then we'll draw a parallel between how your skin feels and how the gut feels. We'll talk specifically about a population of sensory epithelial cells that we study that are involved in a process that we call gut touch, and then explore the role of this system in the function of the gastrointestinal tract, as well as to give you some idea of the future perspectives for our work and the field. Functional and motility GI disorders are common, costly, and challenging. They're extremely common. They span the length of the entire gastrointestinal tract and as shown here include diseases such as non-cardiac chest pain, gastroparesis, functional dyspepsia, chronic abdominal pain, irritable bowel syndrome, slow transit constipation, and pelvic floor dysfunction. They affect 10 to 15% of the United States population, amounting to a huge number of 30 to 45 million uh, American citizens. It is a top three complaint in primary care. And these disorders cost a lot. Irritable bowel syndrome or IBS has a direct cost of $1.3 billion. But even more impressive is the fact that this disease is waxing and waning, meaning that the symptoms come and go. And for our patients, it is typical to see flares of such diseases accounting and amounting to significant loss of productivity of up to $10,000 per patient per year. Now, the diseases that I describe here continue to be challenging to us with respect to their diagnosis and treatment. I wanna make myself clear. It isn't that it's hard for us to diagnose these diseases. It is the fact that we still rely mostly on symptom-based diagnoses. And therefore, we rely on many evaluations before we are finally able to tell our patients what's really going on. Many of the treatments that we have target symptoms rather than the problems or the pathophysiology. And we would like to change this. Now, a typical patient that I will see in clinic will describe a set of symptoms that they develop once they have a meal or they go through defecation. And so our patients will eat or defecate and somehow develop symptoms. These symptoms include nausea, vomiting, diarrhea, constipation, and abdominal pain. So now what happens inside of your abdomen once you eat a meal? And this here is what's called MR, or uh, magnetic resonance enterography, that shows you the activity that happens inside the gut once you've eaten. And what you can clearly see here is that is a hugely vibrant system, the gut, works hard in terms of moving contents around and trying to squeeze out every last nutrient. And therefore, once we eat, we really increase inside of the lumen of the gut, chemical or mechanical energy. And my group in particular is very interested in understanding how the changes of this mechanical energy lead to symptoms in our patients. Now, Abdominal pain has been recognized for a very long time. And in this case, I show you a picture of St. Elmo, who lived 2000 years ago and is a patron saint of abdominal pain. St. Elmo is holding a device that's called the windlass, which is the device that the Romans had used to torture him. This is to show you that when uh, St. Elmo was uh, laid down and the guts were open, this particular uh, piece of intestine was wound up in the windlass. And you can imagine that the stretch strain with the intestine causes a great amount of pain. This was a, an immensely painful procedure. Now, it's been 2000 years, how do we do? 
how do we diagnose problems with our intestines? This is an example of a test that we would do in clinic where we try to figure out the sensory function in our patients. This bottom end here is the rectum. And from the bottom end here, the anus is where the stool comes out. We will put a balloon in and inflate this balloon. As we inflate the balloon, we know that in all patients, normal or abnormal, the inflation of the balloon and the volume is here on the x-axis is in general correlates with the proportion of our patients feeling pain. So at some point, 100% of the patients will feel pain when we inflate the balloon to a certain volume. Well, in patients with irritable bowel syndrome, or in this case called irritable colon syndrome, and the study that Richie did back in the 1970s shows that this curve is left shifted and it runs taller than the curve in solid black. This suggests that our patients have allodynia and hyperalgesia, meaning that they feel pain at lower volumes and they end up developing a larger proportion of patients end up developing pain at these lower volumes. The other issue that our patients will have is motor abnormalities, okay? In this case, I show a patient who has normal colonic transit. We do scintigraphic studies here at Mayo where we have radio-labeled meals that the patient will eat. And at 24 hours in the colon, which we divide into four regions here, plus five being out, you can see that there's a distribution of this meal through the colon on an average, on an average in 24 hours, about two points. At 48 hours, you can see that this content moves along in the colon as I show here, and you can see that the average position moves. Now, in one of the patients that we have recently studied, you could see without doing too deep of a comparison that the colon movement of contents is much slower, both at 24 and 48 hours. And therefore, previous study along with ours show that about 50 to 90% of functional GI patients have what we call mechanopathologies. These are problems in terms of how we feel forces and how we generate forces in the gut. Because of how important these, these uh, mechanosensing properties are, there are extensive intrinsic and extrinsic mechanosensory circuits in the gut. What do I mean by this? So this is the brain and this is the gut, and they're con con connected here by these red lines. The red lines is extrinsic nerves that project from the brain to the gut, and they provide routes or highways of communication between brain and gut. What was always been amazing to me is the amount of sensory processing or amount of nerves and uh, um, innervation that happens right directly inside of the gut. You could see here, I take a cross section of, a, uh, of, of the, the gastrointestinal tract, and I show here in red different cell types that are thought to be involved in processing of mechanical forces that happen in the lumen or inside of the gut shown here. These include cells that are within the epithelium or what I call the skin of the gut that show here. These cells would be connected to neurons and those neurons would be either inside of the gut or projecting to outside of the gut. These cells also collaborate with other cell types. In this case, it's glial cells here, the pacemaker cells of the gut, which are interstitial cells of cajal, and even smooth muscle cells that are involved in sensing mechanical forces and responding to those with physiologic changes. For the rest of the talk, I'm going to focus on this population of cells, which is what my group has been studying in depth. Now, what are these cells? I show some of the work that Fan did uh, back a few years ago, where she took a, a cross section of a mouse intestine. And so this is a, a muscle layer, and in blue here, we see the epithelium, or again, this is like the skin of the gut or the covering of the gastrointestinal tract. The lumen or the contents that of the meals we eat would be inside of the black space here, which you can see here that there are these cyan dots. These little cyan dots, if we were to zoom in on them, would, sh would show up like this. This is one of these typical cells that are in the epithelium of the gut. And you can see here in magenta is actually serotonin. 
And these cells contain massive amounts of serotonin. In fact, this, this cell population makes up roughly 1% of all these epithelial cells shown in blue, but they produce a large range of hormones and other signaling molecules, including neurotransmitters that are critical for normal function. They produce important molecules that we've all heard and learned about, things like serotonin, CCK, VAP, neurotensin, and secretin. These molecules are critical for normal function of the gut as well as of our bodies. And so these cells, while they have small numbers, as you can see here, they have really outsized big roles. The reason that my group has taken uh, a deep interest in this cell population is because of some of the work that Edith Bouldering did back in the 1950s. Edith was just a, an amazing individual who escaped Nazi Germany to establish a lab in London. And there she had made seminal findings, uh, seminal studies uh, relating to the system. What she had shown in this paper in 1959 is that if we were to take a, in this case, it's a cat, intestine, and we were to put some pressure onto that intestine, we find that there's a huge amount of serotonin that pours out of this intestine. As I had said, that serotonin is made and released by the population of cells that I just shown called the enterochromophid cells. Now, as we begun to think about these questions, we'd ask the simple question, are there other places in the body where there's skin or other types of sensory organs that are mechanically sensitive. And what might they do? And so I show here some examples. For example, there are hair cells that are sitting inside of your ear that allow you to hear. This is the epithelium of the ear. In the lung, there are neural epithelial bodies that are sandwiched in to other epithelial cells that allow us to feel how much the lungs inflate. And of course, the classic one is that of touch. So in our skin, such as in our fingertips, there are a cell population called Merkel cells shown in green here that allow us to feel light touch. What was interesting to us as we started thinking about it is the fact that in this population, in all of these different populations, a particular molecule was found to be important for their mechanical function, and that molecule is called piezo-2. Piezo in Greek means squeeze. And so this molecule is responsible for feeling the squeeze on these cells. And because of this, we asked a very naive question. Could our cells that are present in this epithelium of the gut be involved in a process that we would call gut touch? Now, traditionally, we think about touch as this painting where God and man touch their fingers. But touch isn't defined by fingers. It's defined by two objects having a very, very close contact, okay? And therefore, while gut touch wouldn't be like skin touch, it might have a function in the gut. The first thing that we did, and this is some years ago now, is to take a look and see if in this human cells, we have these molecules called piezo-2. And so in this set of studies that Fan did, we found that in a human jejunum, this is a part of your small bowel, these blue lines outline the lining of the jejunum. And in there, we have some dots that are these green dots. These green dots label specific, specific places. And when we labeled this with 5-HT, which is actually serotonin, which is made by these enterochromophen cells, we found that the two markers overlapped beautifully, suggesting that these piezo-2 molecules are present specifically in these 5-HT positive or serotonin positive cells, which are the enterochromophen cells. And therefore, we suspected that this molecule is there. But how do we dig in to really understand whether or not this molecule is functional and whether or not the functionality of this molecule allows for these enterochromophen cells to feel force and to release serotonin? Caitlin and Connie had spent some time optimizing this preparation. And here we used a special genetically traced mouse model where we were able to have all of our enterochromophen or serotonin containing cells be marked in cyan such that we can 
recognize them. So we took these cells and we plated them on a plate and we're able to study them. How do we study this? So in order for us to understand whether or not these cells are mechanically sensitive and specifically do they use these piezo channels to feel the force, we needed to develop a protocol where we take one of these cells and we latch onto it with a small, tiny electrode. For the sense of scale, this is probably one hundredth of the size of a human hair. And in that single cell, we're able to have an electrical connection, but then we bring in a little force probe, which we use to poke down at the cell. When we do this, what we find is that as we squeeze onto the cell, we generate an electrical current. This electrical current I show here, in response to the increasing amount of force, you see an increasing, so actually downward spike is more. That's more current going inside the cell, but we see an increasing downward spike, suggesting that these currents are mechanically sensitive. Note how quickly this happens. This is in milliseconds or thousands of a second. We can push on the cell and very quickly we have this little spike that allows us to understand that these cells are mechanically sensitive. And so we now know that me me membrane forces or forces applied directly to these cells produce an electrical current. And the next question that we had asked is whether or not that current is due to our piezo channels. Now for these experiments, we took this same preparation and then we used drugs or genetic knockdown of our target. So gadolinium, or a tarantula peptide toxin called GSMTX4, are pharmacologic means of blocking these channels. And piezo 2 siRNA is a genetic way of knocking this down. And what we find is that in all of these cases, this spike, this, re this, this increase in electrical current decreases when we, uh, when we block the piezo channels. And therefore we now know that these mechanically sensitive enterochromaffin cells actually rely on piezo 2 channels, which are necessary for mechanotransduction in the system. We then started digging in to try to understand how these cells work and what they might do. I show here an experiment that AJ and Guljan did where they used another mouse model and they were able to look at specifically the enterochromaffin or the serotonin containing cells and also label them with this piezo molecule. Now this is in this is in mouse, but you can see here that there's these two cells right next to each other and one of them has this mechanical sensor and the other one does not, suggesting that there's different populations of these cells. We expect these populations of these different cells to have different jobs, like such that there would be different folks in different institutions with different jobs. And so this here, I show that there is a population of enterochromaffin cells that don't have the piezo channels, many that do. And then there's piezo, uh, piezo positive cells that don't have serotonin. And so we're very interested in understanding how this works. But in order for us to really understand how the system works, or really to begin to dig into this concept of gut touch, what we need to be able to do is to selectively and specifically activate our cells. We need to be able to turn them on and only them specifically so that we could see what happens after one turns them on. We have uh, uh, utilized a system called optogenetics. Optogenetics was developed by, by Carl Dyseroff back in 2005. Uh, and the concept is just amazing. Folks before, Carl had noticed that algae will swim towards light. And when they asked how this might happen, what they found is that there's molecules in the membranes of these algae that respond to light. Now, this is similar to what our eyes do. These molecules respond to light. And what they then found is that once light specifically hits this molecule, it actually is called an ion channel, which is responsive to light. So light hits it and a pore in the cell opens up, allowing flow of sodium and calcium and potassium in this case, which will drive the cell to be activated. And so what we had decided to do was to integrate these sensors directly into this population of mechanosensitive cells that we're interested in, enteroendocrine cells, 
according to her chromaffin cells. And then either with force or with light, we can stimulate them and see how they would affect gastrointestinal function. The things that are important for our patients would be motility. This would be the disruptions that produce diarrhea or constipation and secretion, which is one of the important targets that we found to be in constipation, for example. And so we wanted to test this entire circuitry of how do these cells sense, what do they use to transduce, and how do they affect normal function? And so we proceeded with these experiments uh, by, by really building brand new models and new types of experiments. Caitlin, Khalil, and AJ spent a lot of time optimizing the system. And what they show here is that there's a specific light-gated ion channel called Reacher. That Reacher channel was put specifically into cells that we can co-label with a molecule chr chromogranin A, which labels the big population of enteroendocrine cells but also serotonin. So it lines up specifically in these cells that contain serotonin. And again, specifically, we're able to nail down the population of mechanically sensitive enteroendocrine cells, which express these piezo channels, as I show here. And so when we were able to integrate these light sensors into the cell, we can then begin to ask, how does this work? And how does this system truly affects physiology of the gut. In this case, I show in a cartoon, we take a mouse colon and we could put it into a muscle bath. And in this case here, we have a light, a fiber optic light source, which is right here, a tension sensor to feel how the gut squeezes before and after the light source, as well as a pressure sensor to see if it generates pressure. And so in this experiment here, as an example, I show this setup, and this one is AG and Izzy's work, where they have put a piece of colon. This is the fiber optic, these are the tension sensors, and then there's pressure sensors and such. And when we turn on the light, you could see here that there's motility in this piece of colon that changes. So you could see here how light specifically affects the system. So when we have light off in baseline, we have tension transducer one, tension transducer two, and they squeeze first here and then here. So you can see this diagonal line shows the pressure that is developed along the length of the colon that allows you to push contents along and generate pressure. When we do the same exact situation, but now we stimulate with light, as you can see here in red, you can see that we go from four contractions to five contractions and then we can shut the light off and let the system recover. And when we do these experiments, we don't have light sensors, nothing changes, but with light sensors, we can very clearly see here that shining light on this population of cells that we're interested in allows to us to increase frequency. And so really allows these cells to drive contractile propulsive, con uh, propulsive contractions that allow us to faster or more efficiently push contents. So optogenetic activation of this cell population alters propagating activity in the colon. Now, in this situation, we then asked, okay, so we can now know how this system works by stimulating light, but really we're after understanding how forces work. And in this set of experiments, uh, Izzy and Caitlin had taken the peaks from the previous curves that we showed and just colored them in black. And what we can see here that at the baseline, we can do the same as we do with light by increasing flow. So what we can see here is that while the average contraction will be three or so, here we get four. And we can return that back to normal. And then remember using gadolinium, which is one of the blocker of these channels, this pharmacologic blocker, we can prevent the increase in the contractile activity in response to force. Okay. And in the same situation, in this case, we don't have light sensors, we can shine light and see if that block of mechanical sensing will be bypassed by light. So I show this experiment here at baseline, shear stress or increased stress, so increased flow in, in the colon increases activity. Then we go back to baseline, we block this increase in activity that would be the green bar here. You can see that it's not as high. And then we shine light. And in the situation where we have these 
light sensitive channels integrated, we can see that while we can stimulate with light and force, we can block this response with the pharmacological stimulation, but then we can also bypass that stimulation by light activation, suggesting that it is truly this population of cells that's involved in changing the frequency in response to force. So the next question was, remember, touch is a light force. And we were wondering whether or not the system would be sensitive to the different amounts of force that we apply. So again, at baseline, we have three contractions here. Once we increase luminal flow, we have four contractions here. And then when we increase luminal flow or shear force double or two and a half times that, we can have even more contractions. And so this is showing you that our system responds to forces by changing its contractile frequency. And I show that again as these heat maps here with the peaks being in black. And so in a normal mouse, what will happen is once we have small forces, we have an increase in, in frequency. And then once we have a bigger force, we have a bigger increase in frequency. But what's interesting is that once we knock out or remove these mechanical receptors in our gut touch system, what we actually see is that the small re responses to small forces really almost disappear. You can see here that all of the green dots are above the gray dots, but here in a big population of these cells, they are either same or lower, suggesting that at small forces, we're losing this response. But at big forces, the responses remain. And so this system is really designed for our gut to feel small forces, such as it from particles or other things in the gut. And the next set of questions that we had asked is how these cells might regulate activity in a living animal. And so in the mouse, the first thing we did is we wanted to take a look and see whether or not gut transit or one of the things that our patients would have abnormal is affected by the system. And so we do this using a, um, a, um, an approach we call whole gut transit. We gavage or put into the stomach a small amount of red fluorescent material. We then put the mice into, um, into these chambers. The mice produce pellets, and then we watch how many pellets come out and over how much time. And what we show is that in a normal animal, this is the transit times. And once we knock out the mechanoreceptors in the gut touch system, we find that there is a, a lengthening or the longer amount of time that's required for everything to go through, suggesting slowing of the whole gut transit. And this is nicely consistent with a recent study from Singil Rowe's lab that showed also that really removing this population of cells does slow down the gut. But how does this work? And because of this, we were interested in taking the different parts of the gastrointestinal tract. This is stomach, nothing different happened here. This is small intestine, the longest segment of your gut. And this is colon, which is involved in packing, packaging up and really uh, refining the, the stool. And so we performed a, an experiment using a similar approach as I just showed to look at how the small bowel transits. In this experiment, we take red fluorescent material, we put it in the stomach. About 30 minutes later, we take a look at how far in the small bowel, this is entire thing, is the small bowel length. How far in the mouse small bowel does this material go? You can see here that, for example, in 30 minutes, it went as far as this. And what we found was is that if we gavaged fluorescent red fluid, in a normal case, after 30 minutes, we have a peak. So roughly halfway through the intestine. And if we knock out the mechanosensor in our gut touch system, we see that there's also a peak and perhaps it's in a little bit of a different place. But when we analyzed this, we really didn't see a very significant difference. What had occurred to um, our team, and this is AJ, Izzy, and Arnaldo, is that perhaps we're doing the experiment wrong because touch of fluid wouldn't give you anything, but if you touch solids, then you could feel it. And so we did these same experiments, but now instead of fluid, we put in tiny little microscopic beads. And we found that these beads 
have got distributed by the small bowel significantly different than, than liquids did. And this is, in our opinion, this is the gut taking the solids and distributing them along the entire length of the gut in order to work through that and to break it down further. Now, what's interesting is once we remove the mechanosensor, you can see here that the profile looks a lot like it does above, meaning that the gut really forgot how to take and feel these small solid particles and how to distribute them along the length of it. And so we show here that the responses are quite different. This gut touch system we think is involved in feeling the sizes of the particulates inside of the small bowel and allowing it to readjust its, the gut's function in order to optimize digestion. This is one of the major roles of the gut touch system. We then looked in the colon. Now in the colon, colon produces pellets, stool for us, pellets for mice. And Izzy, when she looked very closely at a lot of these pellets, what she had found is that the pellets in animals that are colored in red here, where the knockout is where we take out the mechanoreceptors from the gut touch system, the pellets of these animals tend to be much, much, uh, much wider, as you could see here. So it requires a bigger pellet for the, for the gut to feel in the absence of the system, which was really fascinating because uh, uh, so, some years ago, uh, Terry Smith had published a paper in Journal of Physiology that showed then when we knock out serotonin from the gut, indeed the thing that really changes is the size of the pellets. And so this was really interesting for us to see. In order for us to test this hypothesis that the system is involved in feeling the sizes of particulates, we performed an experiment where we put in a tiny bead, one to three millimeters into the, the, the distal colon or rectum of the mouse and see how fast it can be expelled. And what we see in, in a normal mouse is that as you increase the size of the bead, it comes out faster and faster. And that is because it likely engages more and more mechanical sensors in, uh, in the gut wall. But in the system where we knock out gut touch receptors, we see that that is lost. And so unfortunately, the colon is not able to feel the size of the particles and it likely takes a larger pellet in order for it to go through the gut. And so let me summarize here and give you a few of our future directions. Mechanical sensing or mechanosensation or sensing of mechanical forces is absolutely critical for normal gut function. It is disrupted in many functional GI diseases, but interestingly, the cellular and molecular mechanisms that we require in order for us to come up with novel diagnostic and novel therapeutic approaches remain poorly understood. This will hopefully change with time. The gut touch receptors, or this mechanosensitive enteroendocrine cell population, mechanosensitive enterochromaffin cells, sense and transduce forces using mechanically gated channels or receptors, mechanoreceptors, as well as voltage gated channels, which is some of the work that I didn't have a chance to talk about today. But for us to make progress, we need to determine which of these molecules and how can we selectively target them if they're under or overactive. Mechanosensitive interendocrine cells help the luminal gut feel the physical properties of luminal contents or tactile discrimination or what we call gut touch. Now looking forward, we're very interested in understanding how these mechanisms work in terms of sensing chemicals and forces. How do they talk? In which cells do they talk to? How do they communicate? What are the roles of physiology and pathophysiology? And how does the system overlap with diseases that, call, that have abnormalities in touch, such as in neuropathy, or gut touch diseases like in chemotherapy, diabetic neuropathies, Parkinson's, and potentially even autism. Mechanosensory circuits in the gut mechanosensitive cells and their roles and connections remain a mystery uh, largely and is going to be a focus of our continued investigations. I have tried to highlight the many folks who have worked diligently and bravely to establish the different methods that we use 
as well as to perform the experiments that can allow us to re re-envision uh, the gastrointestinal physiology and pathophysiology and really begin to rethink how we diagnose and treat a function of patients of functional GI diseases. Uh, this is the group, as I said, very brave, and I'm really thankful to have these folks on my side. I'm thankful to be also a part of the enteric neuroscience program at the Mayo Clinic, where we have vibrant uh, conversations on a weekly basis talking about some of these issues. I'm supported by the Mayo Clinic, and I'm really thankful for the support that I've received uh, within the Center of Signaling, as well as Biomedical Engineering. And I do have several external collaborators, both uh, 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 at the University of Massachusetts, within Howard Hughes, at the SUNY of Buffalo, uh, which is my alma mater. And of course, I'd like to thank Mayo, the Department of Medicine, NIH, AGA for the support for our work. Thank you very much.